that I am recording this session and I will send everybody an email tomorrow with a direct link to the slides and to the recording. If at any time during the session you have any questions, go ahead and type them into your chat box and we'll get to them as appropriate. So with that, I'd like to introduce Mike Watson. He is our VP of Engineering at CenterZip, located in Austin with a bad storm. So hopefully he'll stay with us the whole time. Mike, over to you. Thanks, Jill. Uh, just to be clear, I'm just outside of Austin. So those of you in Austin who are not experiencing the storm, I'm a little bit further south towards San Antonio. Uh, I want to welcome everyone today to our webinar. Uh, it's COVID-19's impact on your product strategy. Uh, given the current socioeconomic climate, understanding how to navigate your product roadmap is going to be of critical importance. Uh, everyone's probably already facing this, and uh, we thought that it would be a great idea to bring on Rich Miranoff, the CEO of Miranoff Consulting, uh, and also a smoke jumper chief product officer. Uh, he's great to talk on this topic. I've talked with Rich before, and we've done webinars with him before, and I always find everything he has to say very intriguing. So, Rich, on to you. Great. Thanks so much, Mike. And uh, I'm hoping everybody's seeing our title slide. Perfect. All right. So, so let's move ahead. Um, uh, we'll probably hold this to about uh, 35 or 40, uh, 40 minutes of prepared content and, and comments, and then we'll open it up for questions from the field. So let's uh, roll right ahead. Um, a little bit about me, for those who don't know me, there's a book on the right that I uh, put out in 2008. I've been in the product management game, mostly on enterprise software for a pretty long time. You see 1998 there as my first uh, software product management job. Uh, the things I do these days, one is I coach or mentor heads of product, chief product officers, VPs of product, sometimes directors of product management. And the other thing, as, as Mike mentioned, I'm a smoke jumper, which means that sometimes a company doesn't have a head of product or they misplace theirs, or for some reason, uh, they're in a bad way in terms of product leadership. I'll drop into a company for a quarter or two, get things straightened out, and then help them hire back in a full-time replacement for myself. Um, the, the story behind that briefly is the Canadian Forest Service, among others, have these folks who are actually called smoke jumpers. And then when there's a big fire, they parachute folks behind the fire to knock down all the fuel and, and contain the blaze. They don't get to go home smoky and tired and smelly until they've gotten through the fire to the other side. So for me, these smoke jumper jobs are pretty exciting, but I'm glad to go home at the end. Um, I've been blogging in the software product management space since 2002, which is really when blogs first arrived. I did some early work in Agile starting in 05 and happened to throw the first product camps out here in Silicon Valley 08. The other thing, and, and it may come up a fair num number of times in our slide set now, is the focus not on output or on uh, development processes, but on outcomes. Are the things we build making a difference for our customers, bring revenue in, reducing churn, reducing support overheads? Uh, how do we know the things we're doing matter as opposed to just have them delivered on time? So we'll touch uh, outcomes versus processes a few times as we go along. Good. And then uh, here's our agenda. Uh, three things and a couple of takeaways. Uh, and I think this should be pretty obvious to folks in the current crisis. Uh, we'll have just one or two slides to talk about the business check-in. Uh, how's your overall business doing? What market are you in? Are you still in business? Because if not, the other bullets don't matter so much. And then the second thing that a lot of folks have been struggling with and working on really hard over the last two months or more, uh, I'm based in San Francisco. I've been under uh, lockdown or shelter in place now for I think seven weeks and feels like a lot longer than seven. Um, but things we can be doing to check in on our teams, making sure they're doing okay, they're working, they're healthy, they're safe. And then finally, we'll get to the core topic, which is to the extent that the coronavirus or other major events and crises out there happen, how do we think about rearranging our roadmap or changing our development plan uh, in the face of sudden changes? And how do we not throw our entire plan away unless that's appropriate? So those are three points. We'll take them in order. Um, if you do have questions, feel free to type them into the chat box or the uh, Q&A box where uh, Mike and Jill can pick them up. Uh, I'll pause for questions as we go as well. Okay, so 
business check-in. Here's the roller coaster, because we've all been on a roller coaster, whether we're following the news closely or not. And uh, my first observation from dozens of calls with product leaders at dozens of companies is that a lot of this depends on the industry you're in and the situation for your specific industry. So if you're in the travel business or the retail business or the restaurant business, um, et cetera, et cetera, uh, your business may be going away. Certainly it's gonna take a huge hit. We saw that uh, Eventbrite laid off about half of their staff because they're in the business of selling tickets to live events mostly. And that's not happening very much. We've seen the airlines contract dramatically. Uh, J. Crew, among others in the major retail space, have closed their doors, declared bankruptcy, and it's all over for them. Um, Airbnb, clearly they're in the travel destination business, renting folks' houses out to other visitors. They just did a 25% layoff. So if you're in an industry that's taking it on the chin because you're a direct uh, recipient of all the goodness of coronavirus, I think the discussion is about how do you keep your business alive between now and when things might or might not return to normal. Um, but other segments, so there's a few bright spots here. We're seeing some areas where in fact, the move to shelter in place and the move online has really boosted some companies. If you're building online tools, and we'll talk about Zoom a little bit later. If you're doing online entertainment, I know that uh, the Netflix folks have been tremendously challenged to address all the scalability and throughput and pipes they need to deliver all of the cool content we're watching at home. Uh, anybody doing physical delivery of stuff, so it's not just Amazon, it's all of the grub hubs and you know, folks who are delivering food and groceries, uh, big uptick, and the part of healthcare that's around crisis management. So if you're working on new vaccines, I think you're working 24 by seven. Um, there's a third group here, which I see as really slowing down, and it's gonna depend a lot on how this plays out over the next few months. But uh, if you're in enterprise software, most of the conversations I'm hearing are that the enterprise customers for those may have slowed down or put the brakes on deals and new installations, but we think they're mostly coming back depending on what sector they're in. If you're in the financial space, you know, banks are still in business, uh, brokerages are still in business, but your plans may have changed. Manufacturing, we're seeing a really scattered variety depending on what you build and who it's for. So clearly if you're making airline parts, it's not as good as if you're making equipment for, you know, some of the food service industries. So it's important before we bother to talk about your specific product plan over the next few quarters, that you've got some idea of where your business is going. And I know everybody's been struggling with this. They don't need me to tell them. So, you know, you're already working on this. Here's a generic chart I put together where suddenly revenue goes down and operating costs don't. Um, uh, I've had a whole series of conversations with heads of product where they're drawing up the spreadsheet that shows a 20% staff cut and a 40% staff cut and maybe a 60% staff cut. So figuring out, you know, how your business is going to survive and, and what we do for the folks who stay, right? Some kind of guesses, again, predictions really hard, especially about the future. I think that was Yogi Berra, but you know, what's the new reality and your best guesses for revenue and customers over the rest of the year. And then where is this going to play out in terms of staff? Some folks are doing deep cuts, closing their doors. Some are pretty protected, but doing staff reassignments or shuffling in the short term so they can answer lots more, for instance, customer support calls on new issues, right? And I am talking to a few folks, again, particularly in online services and software, who are ramping up hiring right now. And it's a great time if it happens to be your little subset of the world, because there's a lot of great people being left on the side of the employment road right now. I know a bunch of them. If you're looking to hire, give me a holler because I know where some of the great talent is hiring is hiding. Good. And then just pointing out the obvious, your product strategy is really a subset of your business strategy. Um, if you're not sure your business is going to survive, much of this discussion may be a little more academic than if you're seeing it up and to the right because you're doing something that's suddenly in demand. So, you know, again, get a good handle on where the business is going because it's impossible, I think to talk about product strategy and product shifts if you're not really clear on the top line and how folks are doing. 
I'll just pause for a sec, Mike. We got any questions there? No. Okay. Well, Not you'll yet. break in if you. Okay. Yeah. We'll keep going. All right. So let's go on to the second thing. Again, this should be obvious, but it's really important that we be doing it, which is to be thinking about your team. There's the telemedicine picture, right? Um, we as leaders, we as managers of whatever function we're in, need to make sure that we are thinking hard about the folks who work for us and work for our company. And I'm going to divide this into two pieces, of course, for the folks who are going to still be with your company after you've done whatever restructuring the next four or six weeks have, uh, there's a bunch of things you really need to be doing as a leader. Uh, I've been spending a lot of time on the phone doing these two on Zoom as well. Um, are your folks physically safe? Are they getting fed? Are they healthy? Uh, is there something you need to do for them uh, that's really important about physical survival, you know, human survival rather than the practicalities of your work? Second thing, I think um, a lot of folks are suddenly working from home for the first time or certainly full time for the first time. And we should be thinking about all the practicalities of broadband. If they don't have it, can we get it to them? Uh, cameras and, you know, monitors and green screens and maybe printers or scanners. What are the things that folks might need that they don't have in their home offices? Maybe they don't even have a home office. They're working in the basement or over the kitchen table, right? And then there's a lot of things I think we're learning about our workmates here. The ones who have kids that are home from school and are looking for attention in the middle of our meetings. Uh, the ones who have pets, right? or uh, other folks in the house, or we get to see their buildings for the first time. Um, there's gonna be a lot of challenges here. If you're a parent trying to take care of kids, it's gonna be hard to schedule a lot of meetings to work into the night to help them get online for their homework. Let's really think about the folks who might be deep introverts and come to the office for a little bit of contact and don't have that, or the ones who are severe extroverts who are worried about not being able to see any people except over the video. You know, think about your folks, check in with them, find out what they need. It's not just about the tech. Um, I know some folks who've airlifted uh, or, or at least remote ordered chicken soup for delivery to some of their sick employees or chocolates or whatever, we'll get to that, right? Um, and then unfortunately, a lot of us are thinking about or having to let folks go and that's brutal, it's brutal for them, less for us. But we should be thinking about the longer term here. I know, at least in the product management business, that you're gonna meet the same people over and over again at subsequent companies. You're gonna work for them, they're gonna work for you, you're gonna be at some client or customer of yours. We wanna treat them as they leave in the way that really shows respect and you know thinks about the long-term reputation of our company. So, if you're able to negotiate good exit packages for your folks, if there's stock vesting that's coming up just three months from now and you can include in the package. Um, one other thing that I've been spending a lot of time talking with folks about who are leaders and letting folks go, you as a manager or executive at your company should spend a little time with the folks who are leaving and agree on what your reference story is gonna be. You're gonna get a phone call from some employer, we hope, in just a few months and you and that employee should be really clear on what you're going to say about why they left and how their performance was. So there's no surprises here. Um, if it's somebody you couldn't recommend to hire somewhere else, you really owe people that message. If it's really a big company riff, you want to do everything you can to make sure your good folks who worked hard for you are going to find some other place. Um, there was a great post from, um, the CEO of Airbnb, uh, Brian uh, Chesney, I think is his name. And he talked about how he's spending a lot of his time helping the folks who are leaving his company get good placements and references, right? We are all in this for the long term. We want to think about our company reputation, right? We want to do the right thing. It's not just good for business, it's good for us. So again, for the folks who are on your team, how do we help them succeed? For the folks no longer on your team, how can we help them recover and move on to the next thing well? Especially if you might want to hire them back someday. How you treat them really matters right now. Okay, so one more slide on folks, you know, on people and teams before we get to roadmaps. Here's our little uh, tether. I think this is um, Edwin White in the very first uh, extra vehicular 
spacewalk from the U.S. space program. That would have been, uh, I think, uh, 1967. Anyway, uh, we talked about work tools and interactions, things that you might need to get, right? Hot spots, whatever. Um, I think you want to be thoughtful about the, the weight of your meetings. So I'm talking to folks who are in three and four and six and nine hours of Zoom meetings a day. Uh, make sure you remember that your folks are supposed to be doing some stuff, taking action items out of those meetings, uh, as well as needing time for lunch and walking the dog and taking care of the kids and all the other things they have to do. So be conscious of lightweight work here. I might suggest some lightweight retrospectives where you get the folks on your team briefly together and talk about how we can rearrange our tools or work schedules or ticketing or whatever it is. Apply your good agile learning to working from home for folks who may not have done it, right? And then maybe again, more importantly, the emotional and company culture side of this. We need folks to feel like we care and we actually need to care, right? So things like, right, make sure you've got support um, you're letting folks have schedule freedom where we can, where you can for the things that make some sense here, right? Um, remember that folks have obligations at home that are not just yours. Um, have some fun. Uh, we've been experimenting, uh, some clients of mine and I with different ways to lighten it up a little bit. Bring your pet to the meeting day, right? Um, karaoke and cocktails, whatever it is. Um, how do we make this feel a little less onerous, a little less crazy? Right. And then what could we drop ship? So, you know, maybe you're going to send chocolates to everybody. We're going to have a chocolate tasting in our Friday staff meeting, right? Team t-shirts, diapers for the folks who have kids that need it or food. What are the ways we can show our teams that we're thinking about them? We understand their situation. We're checking in. We're helping as best we can. Because again, on the far side of this, these are folks who you need to trust and respect you and stay with the company. Uh, don't lose them due to inattention here. Okay, so so that's the humane part of this. We're going to now switch into the product planning, product strategy, product roadmap part of the discussion, assuming you've done those other two things. Again, um, Mike, I'm going to pause for just a sec. Go. Yeah, Rich, I just had a thought or a comment uh, people in my circle have been talking about is it seems like going to your point about treating employees well and you know, do you have a viable business? It seems like businesses that are viable will do fine. You know, people that treat their employees well and have a good business model and those that don't may struggle. Uh, I think that's kind of part of what you're saying, but uh, that really feels right to me. I think that's right. And, and to the extent that we have long-term investments in our business and our staff and our employees and our talent, now's the time for us to show them the care and respect we need. Um, I've talked to a couple of folks where the executives are hiding the fact that the business is not going well, but everybody knows. So, you know, this, this is again, I, I think a chance for us to show our leadership because when it's all over, people are going to be much, much more loyal to the companies that supported them, looked out for them, kept them on when they could. Good. All right, let's jump into the product side, which is where I spend most of my time living. Um, and uh, I've got three very little tiny case studies coming up. And I have to tell you that two of the three are from clients of mine. And I've gone out of my way to dis disguise all the details because, of course, I don't want to be sharing their product plans out here. But I've generalized in a way that I think will be useful for the audience. So uh, and on the right, for those of you who don't know Jenga, this is everybody's roadmap or everybody's product plan. If you move one piece, it often falls to the floor because we're almost all overbooked, overpromised, and it's complicated. There's a lot of dependencies. So before we decide to change our product plans, change our roadmaps, reshuffle some things, we want to be just a little bit thoughtful here. So I'm always advocating on these quick switches that we do some thinking quickly before we do some acting quickly. Let's make sure, let's take the one day or the two or three days before we shuffle the box and knock all of the Django pieces down to make sure we're doing the right things. And the key distinction for me in these discussions is, do we think there's a fundamental long-term change for our customers based on our product or market or how they're gonna use our stuff? Or is this really a short-term thing? For instance, if your customers are airlines, you may suspect that we're in for a couple or three years of very bumpy flying. And so, 
changes that you make to your company in terms of reducing costs and you know changing roadmaps are probably going to be with you for the next few years don't know but that's our guess whereas other kinds of markets might be interrupted briefly but we think they're going to snap back pretty fast and we don't want to do anything that throws away our long-term strategy or long-term value by substituting a couple things in that five weeks from now may be less urgent so you want to really think carefully about short versus long-term and urgent versus not urgent before you shake the roadmap because it's hard to undo that right um and then here's a word i use in every post and every talk and every webinar i do validate 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 this might be as simple as calling up five or six of the customers you think are smart and are currently paying you money and running those choices past them before you commit because it's easy to get some group think it's easy to sit around the table and decide we know what's true in the world but getting a half a dozen customers giving you the thumbs up or the thumbs down or the i don't understand why you would do that really important so we don't overcorrect. it's also again a good sign of respect to the customers that you know know what's going on because they'll give you some reality checks and it may save you some steps so think then validate then act okay and the other thing i see everywhere and it's not just during the crisis it's every day of every year i see most executive teams forget that their development organizations are overbooked busy fully at capacity i have never met an engineering team or a development team that really had any slack at all so when we think of really cool thing we're always trying to apply the and logic oh let's do everything in the roadmap and Here's this one more, I bet it's not so hard, probably only a couple of days, may only be 10 lines. Rich, we seem right? to have lost you a little bit. Okay. Um, if you could just repeat the last sentence, I think you're back sure. now, there's just a little hiccup okay. in the system. No worries, right. So it's easy at the executive level to believe that we have capacity in our development or, or engineering organizations, and it's almost never true, right? So the and theory says we can do everything we plan and one more two more something easy we can slip this in it's not so hard but in fact almost every development organization really works on the inclusive or model which says if we want to do something new we have to push something else back and we as executives hear this all the time but somehow we like to discount it or think it's not true i think it's even more true in a crisis because we know a lot of our team may not have the best tools maybe having some you know crises of their own at home they're going to be less productive they're going to be working on new processes right we're going to get less out of our team already with all the complications so if we think something's worth doing we must 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 ask what we're going to not do instead right now and in the three examples i'm going to try to give you one each of something where we're going to postpone or delete or revise because we think we want to move something new to the forward. Good. Jill, we're coming through okay? Yes, loud and clear, thanks. Okay, perfect. All right, so let's dive into some, some examples. Again, I've generalized these. I've taken the names of the first two off because I know who they are and you're not supposed to know. But I think just sampling a few different kinds of businesses, uh, software businesses, uh, will give us just a flavor for how to think about this set of problems, right? So the first one's one I think is probably unfamiliar to most of you, but I've spent a lot of time with a couple of companies in this space. Um, one particular company makes mobile applications for churches and religious groups and other not-for-profits, particularly ones who do a lot of in-person events. You can imagine that you know, some uh, multi-location mega church which has five or six um, you know buildings and they have people coming in on sundays and they have all kinds of things they're doing communications out to their uh, their members or a not-for-profit that has an auction once a quarter as its way of raising money or other kinds of folks who are trying to reach uh, an optional audience of non-employees right so there's a little picture of somebody who's following along on some event on the phone and and this company builds mobile apps for those folks so they can connect their remote or you know millennial generation folks to what's happening um when we looked at the q2 roadmap that we put together in january before uh, most of us knew this was happening it turned out the number one thing at the top of our roadmap 
was a really important new feature that everybody's been asking for, which is when an adult brings their kids to an event and there's some kind of kids area or daycare or other kind of, of care space, uh, everybody wanted a check-in feature where the parents could check the kids in and then automatically, if there was an issue, they could get a text message back about their kid, right? Really important, top of the list, back in December, January, last, you know, Q4, uh, everybody was very excited about this. Turns out in the current environment where folks are not going to events, this will eventually be important again, but maybe not right now. So this might be a candidate for pushing back or delaying or rethinking because it's not going to get used for the next quarter or maybe two. So, but we do get to look down the backlog of things that we thought were important but didn't make the cut and ask, what are the things that are suddenly more important in the current situation? What will our customers need now that we might be able to do something really quick or you know, incomplete but useful, uh, get something out there that both shows that we understand our customers and helps them in the current situation? And one of the things that happened to be hiding in the backlog here was um, something we knew we had to do, but suddenly was more important, which was a lot of work on scalability of the back end, because this particular application lets these not-for-profits and religious organizations stream their events out. And now everybody's streaming. So just like Zoom, we're seeing that usage and capacity on this that we thought was fine in January is not fine. So throwing folks against this is not an option. It's a requirement right now. How do we keep all the systems working? I think that was obvious. The other thing that sort of popped up was a feature that we had lurking in the background where remote folks could ask for some kind of assistance or help. Food deliveries, somebody to call them on the phone for a chat and some companionship, um, other kinds of, I need my organization to do something for me Right? And suddenly, this led to the top of the list because, again, everybody's remote. So it, it may seem a little bit, a bit obvious. It was a pretty big piece of work. And so we're busy trying to figure out how to do something in three weeks rather than six months such that we can roll something out right away to the key customers who are waiting for this. Again, um, if it were a six-month piece of work, we'd have to wonder whether it's going to matter in six months. So if we can't do it in three weeks, maybe we don't do it. Right. OK. Um, how do we add value now? How do we make an impact now? How do we look at our backlog and our work and our roadmap and apply good theory, you know, good insights without shaking the box and completely changing everything we're doing if it's not appropriate? Good. So I'm guessing most of you are not in the not for profit in person event software business. So let's take a couple of other examples. Um, here's one maybe more familiar folks. Uh, there's a lot of companies that build backend software for banks and financial organizations and brokerages and stuff. Um, and banks aren't going away. Uh, but when we looked at our roadmap, it turned out that the number one thing on our roadmap for the current set of sprints in Q2 was uh, some major rework of the workflow for the employees in the banks for how to open up new accounts uh, for people who are there in person. Again, it made perfect sense in January, may not be as urgent now, right? But a lot of things are happening in the finance world. Sorry, finance. Finance is when it's over a million dollars a year. Um, one of the things that popped up right away is many banks and brokerages and mortgage companies are faced with having to have new rules around waiving fees and waiving late items and deferrals and missed payments, right? It's part of new short-term regulations coming out of the Treasury Department. So suddenly this really is an urgent item for all of your banking customers if you're in this space. And here again, quick is better than perfect. We don't know how long this is going to last. It may only need two months worth of runtime or three. If it's going to take you four months to build it, don't bother. So how do we knock together something out of specs we might have considered to be a big project? and get something to our customers now, it shows them we love them, it supports their work, it builds good relationships, and later on when it's renewal time, we'll be able to remind them that we had their best interests at heart and didn't charge extra for it, right? Again, so reprioritizing. One of the other things we found in this particular backlog 
was a complete rework end to end to end, rethinking, redesign, UX, UI, customer experience of the way that they use their transfer opportunities. So if you're logged into your bank and you want to send money to some other individual, it turned out this particular set of banking software, pretty hard to use, not very good, uh, hard and bumpy. And they had planned a really long project for this. Well, at the moment, a lot more people are trying to use this particular feature and getting into trouble. So is there a way we can take our six month project, chop it up into three or four or five pieces, do one of them now aggressively, quickly, make some improvements to this workflow for transferring money between individuals and get something out, right? We'll have to come back and clean it up later, but urgent needs are gonna jump ahead of some of the other things we were doing. Again, I don't know your business. I can't know your business as well as you do, but the pattern here again is look at what we're building now, decide if it's still urgent and strategic. If it's strategic, but we need to pull something in forward, can we move it back just a little bit? And can we do something small and short and aggressive and agile rather than moving a seven month project forward and another seven month project back? Okay, we've got one more example that is not a client of mine. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, uh, I have a question about that um, last example. Yep. Did you find that, uh, it's actually two parts, but I'll start with the second part actually, sure. which is, did you find that uh, these large organizations, like potentially big banks that you're working with, um, became more agile on the product side as a result of this? Like they started to get this agile concept of why the development teams want to do uh, these smaller chunks? Um, I'll politely say no. <laughs> um, Darn. <laughs> I, 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 I do see that vendors of software that sell their software to banks have gotten a lot more agile, or at least they, they're showing agility. But Got it. Uh, right, I, I think there's a distinction here between folks who make software for a living and they're in the business of building software and if it doesn't work or people don't like it, they're out of business and they go home and lose their jobs versus a big organizations that are in some other business, retail, airlines, government agencies. I think it's a lot harder for those folks to turn on a dime, particularly because for the most part, they have IT organizations as opposed to engineering organizations, and they view those IT organizations as cost centers. And so there's much more likely to be cuts to the IT organization than shifts in priorities that lets that IT organization do the urgent thing. Okay, got it. Uh, that's that's too bad. I mean, it's a good opportunity for them, but you know, it is what it, it is. is. I will always suffer through that. So the first part of the question was, did you get a lot of pushback on trying to move quickly or pushing out things on the roadmap that everyone thought was important? Or was there a community saying, yes, it totally makes sense that we should make these pivots? Uh, for the most part, it was the second. It was the community nodding their heads, maybe even slapping their foreheads and saying, yes, of course, that's obvious. And either they thought of it or they didn't. But um, rolling out some small things that really help in the current moment um, has gotten a great reception from almost everybody I've talked to. Um, and, and it makes perfect sense to push back some things which aren't as urgent in the moment. So um, I'm seeing customers react very, very positively to this. Otherwise, we'd be in a lot of trouble. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Rich. Okay, good. One more example, which will be familiar to everybody and is not my client, so I, I can put their name on it, right? Zoom, here we are, everybody doing virtual cocktail, right? Um, if you go back a quarter or two or three and look at Zoom's material, you'll find out their target audience has always been business users, corporate users, right? And, and they had something on the order of 10 million folks who love Zoom, but we're using it almost exclusively for work, you know, both internal and uh, customer to vendor, right? Suddenly, we found that, that the audience has ballooned in the last uh, eight weeks to something on the order of 200 million folks, almost all of whom are consumers or using it for their consumer practice. So it's checking in on your grandparents, it's, you know, virtual dinner parties and, and book clubs, it's all of the things we're doing to try to stay human and humane and in touch with folks in the current crisis. So if you notice, that's a 20X increase in users and in traffic and everything. And almost all the new users are worried about how to get the basics working and they may be much less tech savvy 
than our business users are. So again, we're going to have to think hard about whether we're going to flip things around. Uh, there was a lot of publicity around this, both positive and negative. I think uh, Zoom shareholders were pretty happy, but things we noticed right away, right? Scalability had a lot of issues. I was on some um, remote working uh, workshops where for a couple of days we couldn't get breakout rooms to work because the we don't quite know, but we think some of the um, the, the microprocessors in the back, you know, some, some of the coding in the back wasn't designed for the level of scale that breakout rooms were using. And for a couple of days, they kept falling over, right? We've had a lot of security issues. Um, I've been on a couple of, of uh, meetings where we got Zoom bombed and people who we didn't know came in and put impolite pictures up and such, which, you know, it's kind of impolite in a work setting. Much, much more serious if you're running your classroom for preschoolers over Zoom. So uh, Zoom did exactly the right thing here. Uh, no surprise, because it's a really smart company. They threw everyone they could against scalability and security and infrastructure, uh, introduced a bunch of new passwords, a bunch of new uh, security features, such that it was a little less convenient to use, but protected these 200 million people against some things that they really weren't prepared for. So I think that was obvious. It was a hard call, but maybe not so hard. Um, but when we look at the next set of things, and I don't know the answer, so I'm going to pose this as a question because um, it's a strategic question for the company. Um, one can either look at this and say, when this is all over in two weeks or six weeks or 11 weeks, we expect our audience to shrink back to 10 or 20 or 25 million corporate users, and we're back on strategy with all the things we're going to do back in integrations and tying to various email and calendaring systems and stuff. Or we could have a change in strategy and decide that we're really the new tool for consumers. And we're somehow we're going to try to keep 100 million of these folks and extract some money from them because right now they're mostly getting it for free. So rather than shifting their plan around without some good thought, I'm hoping they're going to spend a few weeks or maybe a month or more really thinking hard about a left turn or a right turn in their product strategy. Because if they shift to consumers, many many things on their backlog that were really designed just for corporate customers think about all the single sign-on things that people use are going to be de-emphasized and they're going to do less of a good job for their corporate customers i think it's hard to build a product in both spaces and these are smart folks so i'm expecting they're wrestling with questions like this right now and you may be as well so if you think that that the the covid crisis has really shifted your market take a breath think hard, do a little research, plan out the financials, because if you shift your market and you have to come back, it's going to be pretty costly, pretty expensive. All right, so I have some takeaways and then we'll open this up for a bunch of questions. Here's our takeaways. And for those who aren't getting food deliveries in the current situation, this, by the way, is a takeaway container. Okay, so some quick takeaways and then we'll open it up for, for questions. Business survival, right? Is your company going to be around? That's what's going to drive both your people plan and your product strategy. Start there, figure out where your company is. Then, and only then, remember that your roadmap was built with a lot of old assumptions. Maybe it was last quarter, maybe it was last year. Um, open those up. Don't just ask what features are in the roadmap or in your plan. Ask why they were there. Your senior product folks should have a lot of good explanations for whether their logic has changed, whether the situation has changed, or it's still true. Don't throw something away just because you have some other good ideas, right? Um, right, validate, validate, validate. Look for urgent but small adjustments. Honestly, anybody who tells you they know where this is going is either self-deluded or lying to you. We really don't know what the future looks like right now. So try not to make big strategic shifts unless you're pretty sure. Look for short wins, look for three day and, and 11 day wins that are going to give value to your customers now without necessarily trashing your one year plan. And then remember, 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 and I said it a few times, but I'm going to say it again because we keep forgetting. If you're going to move something forward, it means you have to move something back. Your teams are busy. They're catching all kinds of flack. They're a little less productive. They're scattered around the world, maybe in ways that you're not used to. Um, just remember that there's more to do here than just add one more thing, right? 
be thoughtful, be strategic, and then be quick and action oriented. Okay, there's our takeaways. Um, Mike, do we want to take some questions before we get to the centers of slides? And I'm not hearing you. I think you're on mute. Yeah, Mike, we can't hear you. Yeah. I'm off mute now. <laughs> Good. Um, so one question before we get into the, uh, to, you know, start gathering more questions is, um, if do you have any advice for anyone that needs to pivot? Like if you're a company that's, uh, you know, heading in the wrong direction, ready to pivot, what do you, what do you suggest there? Yeah. Um, the first thing I always ask about pivots is, do we have enough money in the bank to get through the pivot? Sometimes we have some real optimism around how easy it's going to be to pivot. It's almost always harder than we planned. New customers, new markets, new problems, new features, new capabilities. Um, if you're going to pivot, uh, I would I would check the bank account first because there has to be enough gas in the tank to get you to the next place. Got it. Great. So um, why don't you advance the slide and I'll talk a little bit okay. about uh, Synerzip and sure. what Synerzip has, has to offer. Yeah. Right, there's my, uh, it's in the handout, but there's how to find me. Notice that my name is the answer to all the questions. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, so um, I want to thank again, everyone for joining. Uh, so a little bit about Synerzip. We're an agile software co-development partner. What that means is we're here to help you accelerate your product roadmap. Uh, we're also available to help you exercise new technologies, like maybe if you uh, don't have a mobile app and you need a mobile app and it's a short-term need, uh, we can help you uh, expand your team uh, with various technologies that maybe aren't on your long-term roadmap. Uh, we're Pune-based in terms of our delivery, so that allows us to offer you know much lower rates than if you were gonna use uh, onshore uh, type resources or even uh, near shore. And then uh, we also have the ability to uh, provide uh, onshore resources to help with uh, various different aspects, uh, architecture, senior development, uh, UI, UX, or even uh, product management uh, when you're not doing fire jumping. <laughs> uh, so that's a little bit about Synerzip. Next slide. So we have uh, quite a bit of customers. Synerzip has been around for over 15 years, heading into 16 in August. Uh, we've had quite a few customers through that life cycle, and uh, we really like our customers and uh, enjoy partnering with them to help them be successful. Next slide. Next in the series of webinars is API as a product uh, with Rajiv Kushik. Uh, he, I think he's done something similar in the past. It was very well received. Uh, I would definitely uh, check this out. API as a product. It's next week on Tuesday, so a week from today, uh, same time frame. Oh, great. And here's, here's your- Storm is back. <laughs> Storm is back. Yeah, so Rich, if you wanna uh, move it over to your uh, information slide, that would be yeah, fine. Yeah, sure, we'll, we'll come uh, back to here. Yeah, thank you very much. Sure, I'm actually gonna go back one more to the takeaways because I think we'll, we'll, we'll wanna have those up where people can see them. Yeah, perfect. Um, okay, fire when ready. So early on the conversation, so this comes from the audience. Uh, early on in the conversation, um, you talked about outcomes versus outputs, which uh, triggered thoughts for this, uh, for one of the audience members. And he's wondering, how does he learn more about that particular topic? Um, there's a lot of good writing. Um, there's a great Bush book by Josh Seiden called Outcomes versus Output. There's a hint. Um, but I think the general takeaway, also um, Melissa Perry has a really good book called The Build Trap. Uh, I'll, I'll, Mike, I'll get the, the uh, links so we can put them up in the materials. But I think the, the general trend here is you wanna measure whether folks actually use your new feature or capability or product and whether they get value out of it in a customer measurable way, as opposed to measuring whether we shipped on time. Shipping on time is fine, but if you ship something on time that folks don't use or doesn't generate revenue or increase um, customer loyalty or reduce churn or reduce support tickets or something measurable, then I think you're mostly in the vanity metric space, right? So output is counting story points and counting delivery dates 
and those are handy from an from a development point of view from a product management point of view they're not really where we focus uh, if i'm shipping a new feature it's because it's going to do something internally or in the market and if folks are adopting it and and upselling themselves or we're dramatically reducing numbers of support tickets on a bad workflow then we're looking at outcomes and the best time to try to guess what the outcome is going to be for a feature or a capability is before you build it not after so if we've got something in the backlog if we've got something in the heap we should be asking the question before we start before we spend the money before we assign it to the team what does success look like how are we going to measure it and then at the end we'll do a retrospective on the metric and see how we did we don't have to fire anybody but we have to know what good looks like from a customer and external point of view not just did we get a bunch of stuff done that we said we were going to get done yeah i like that i like that thank you um another question came in um so you talked about validating quickly um yeah. as an important step can you tell give us a little bit of advice how you would do that in particular if you have b2b type software yeah i think that's right and b2c software in, in, way, in many ways is easier to validate because there may be thousands or hundreds of thousands of people out there willing to take a three minute survey or take your $20 to answer some questions. On the enterprise side, on the B2B side, uh, you've got long term committed customers, you've got much smaller numbers of them versus consumer products. And you've, and you've got to be much more sensitive about how you do that because rolling something out that doesn't work is disastrous. And just asking folks if they like something, they'll almost always say yes. Right. So I usually try to have my teams keep in their back pockets the names of five or 10 or 41 different customers that they respect the opinions of and really use the product and that they could place a five minute call to or send a quick email to get a live discussion. Again, that's not a survey. That's not a check the box. That's a live voice to voice or face to face where you talk them through the problem and see if they agree that you've correctly identified the problem and then talk them through one or more solutions and see if they agree that your proposed solutions actually address the problem. It's not scientific because, you know, five or nine of those isn't really enough to, you know, to put on a chart, but it's enough that if you're making a, a, a significant mistake, you'll have three or four of those folks tell you to your face that it's not such a good idea. Again, before we finish the feature, not when we're ready to roll it out. We're, we're considering moving this around in the roadmap and we think it's a good idea. Who are the five folks who opened up tickets with support to ask for it? And can we walk it past them? You know, maybe there's some diagrams, maybe it's just a voice to voice, but we're trying not to sell. We're trying to extract knowledge and find out if it's a good idea. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds good. Uh, it's in line with uh, some of the things we talk about internally. Uh, in terms of you know the face-to-face -face conversations where you get the real answer right the, that's right and it's a lot like what what um what designers and ux folks do um you know if, if you show it to four or five folks and they can get through the new workflow more easily than the old workflow it's probably better if you show it to four or five folks and they all stumble well you didn't lose a lot it may have just been balsamic or sketches or you know knock together some demo code you can go back and fix it Uh, so there's quite another question here. It's related to AI big data. And um, do you have any, I think it's asking, are there any suggestions on what markets might be good to target for that type of product? Um, I've got a couple of really long posts on, on machine learning. I, I spent part of last year at two machine learning companies. Um, uh, you know, it's the hot moment for it. You know, it's at the top of the Gartner hype cycle. Um, uh, it turns out I worked on some AI stuff in the 70s when it didn't work and in the 80s when it didn't work and in the 90s when it didn't work. And, um, my, my caution is it's pretty easy these days to imagine machine learning working and imagine that AI is going to deliver a lot of value. Um, getting it to work is hard. You need real data scientists. You need you know, large data sets and, and test sets and, and comparison data. Um, and often the folks you're going to show it to don't know what success looks like here. So it's hard to put together success metrics. 
Um, really important to do that thing in advance and make sure that we have a plan to maintain the quality of the data or the machine learning over time. These things tend to degrade as the world moves forward and our data that we trained it with gets older. So when I think about machine learning and AI stuff, it's an ongoing effort. You're gonna to have to have a data science team on it forever, not just one time. And you're gonna to have to have good test metrics to figure out, there's always some corner cases we didn't think of or some places where it gives the wrong answer. What's our escalation mechanism? So if a customer thinks that it gave him the wrong answer, they can raise their hands and have us check the work, right? Um, it, it's gonna bring a lot of wonderful things, but it's not magic. And it's easy on the sales and marketing side of a lot of companies to imagine that we can throw some data scientists in a room for an hour, give them a whiteboard, and at the end of it, somehow our product's smarter. It's way harder than that. Okay, great. Um, another uh, question. Uh, we've got about nine minutes, Rich, so we're doing pretty good in time. Perfect. Um, another question here is um, if you're in a startup, you I mean you're just getting started and maybe you started over the last couple of months or last six months, uh, is there something you would do differently in terms of your product prioritization? Uh, assuming your product's valid, right? Is there any kind of yeah. nuance that we should consider? Uh, honestly, I think it's very, very uh, product dependent and, and market dependent. Um, again, I'd go back to that same exercise. If you did a bunch of validation interviews and discovery in November, and it seemed like a really, really good idea at the time, I might pick out another half dozen folks who you didn't interview last time and do some extra discovery or validation checks to see whether something's happened in the world that you haven't thought about. Um, you know, we know that most startups fail, but they almost always fail for a reason that isn't one that the, um, the, the founders assigned to themselves. They almost always assign it to a market issue, right? Um, right. regardless. Um, but you know, go back, spend a little time going back over your notes from last August or whenever you kick this off and think about what's not true. Call up a few folks at your target consumer or business audience, um, get out there and do a little extra hustle because there's nothing worse than shipping something that made sense last year and may make sense in 2022, but uh, is dead weight here in 2020. Yeah, sounds, sounds good, thanks. Uh, so another question, um, this one's actually coming from me <laughs> and uh, it's a little bit of uh, Rich, put on your crystal ball and try to figure out what's gonna happen in the future, but that's not actually the point. <laughs> uh, really like, do you think there's gonna be a change in how product management works post COVID? Or do you think we're still looking at the same things, same diligence, et cetera, et cetera? Um, I think there's gonna be a difference in some of the products we build and some of the companies that we create, I think as a discipline, product management's pretty general. And we're gonna apply the same product management concepts and approaches, but we're gonna end up building different products or maybe even different companies because needs may have shifted, right? So um, I see product managers as primarily, you know, the very first thing we do, and second and third and fourth and eighth, is we spend a lot of time with prospective customers and markets trying to figure out what's broken and where there's a need. That's, that's maybe our number one responsibility. And given that, we're gonna be out there finding out what new needs have developed and what old needs have fallen away. But I think we're gonna apply the same tools, which is customer understanding and economics and working with our teams to spec out good solutions and trying to do pricing that's, that reflects value. That all makes sense, yeah. All right, so there's uh, six minutes left. Uh, not a lot of questions coming in. Um, I do have some questions. There was there was one that uh, came in that had to do with anything really well. yeah, there was one about certifications for for um, uh, drugs and and medicines and regulatory environments, which I thought was interesting. So um, one yeah. of the questions was was yeah, asking about, about that. Yeah, there's a certification called 21 CFR 11 which is something that the Food and Drug Administration applies to medicines and uh, pharmaceuticals and, and hospital products. And the question was, is there any guidance for that, particularly around software as a service related to uh, medicines and hospitals? Um, and I think the underlying question was, 
Um, we can't move as fast as other SaaS companies can move because we've got to get through regulatory steps, maybe. And I think my, my answer, which always is, it depends, is some software products are actually in the middle of the clinical cycle. For instance, if it's creating a new drug, and then you're going to have to go back to the FDA and get approval. But there's other software, which is really in the business cycle. If you're building ERP software for hospitals, I'm pretty sure you don't have to get the FDA to approve changes to that. If you're building software that manages inputs from field tests and drug tests out in the, in the wild, I don't think the software itself needs to have its changes approved by the FDA. So, you know, you want to take apart your product. And if it's subject to those regulations directly, you may have to slow down and fill out a bunch of extra paperwork. On the other hand, I'm pretty sure there's some folks at the FDA who, if you told them this was to address a crisis, they might just give you a pass. It's worth asking. Yeah, great. Uh, one more, we prompted one more question. Uh, so you've mentioned earlier that uh, you've, most most uh, communities are, you know, those constituents were uh, agreeable to making the pivots or changing the product strategy. What if someone isn't? Do you have any advice for that? Well, you know, that's one where my product managers kick that problem back to me because I have much uh, more politically sensitive hands with customers. Um, it's always the case that whenever we put out a roadmap, we have customers who are unhappy with it. There's all, it's always the case that at least in the B2B enterprise space, Every one of our customers has some things they want us to put in the roadmap, which are just for them and their one offs. And so as product folks and as general software execs, we have to be comfortable with explaining our logic to customers and thanking them for their input. And then sometimes telling them they're not going to get what they want, even if they're the biggest customer that we have. Uh, if you can't do that, then you end up reverting back into a custom development for hire model where you have to recoup the full cost plus um, overhead on every piece of work because you're only building it for one customer at a time. Um, I spend most of my time in what I would call the product business. And the product business is defined as we're going to sell the exact same bits to dozens or hundreds or thousands of customers without customization so that we can get up the volume curve and hit break even and collect money in the 90% margin category. As soon as you're doing a little bit of customization for each customer, you've got to rearrange the economics of your business because much or most of your work only gets used once and so only gets expensed once. And so you've got to charge a lot more money for it. Yeah, so Rich, one of that's an internal uh, constituent. Uh, one of the things that I heard recently is that facts are friendly uh, and opinions are interesting, but you know, not relevant. Uh, what do you think about that? Well, I know there's a lot of companies and they tend to be internal users where the senior vice president of strategically making life miserable for everybody else gets to make calls because of some you know, strong political base that the IT organization has to honor, right? And that's not, not, that's not a happy or pleasant thing to say, but it happens in a lot of places. Um, you know, it's important to understand where your direction comes from. And if it's true, walks down to your development organization every Tuesday and Friday with a new thing to put in the roadmap and fires anybody who says no, then I think that's your reality and you've got to live with it, right? Um, as the person who comes in to run the product and sometimes product and development organizations, I think it's my job to figure out how to politely and humbly um, turn those around, find some political jujitsu so that we can get the right things done and still treat our internal stakeholders appropriately and well. That's kind of a non-answer, but it's what it is. Yeah, I mean, it's a difficult problem anytime you have a difficult constituent that you know is, isn't willing to kind of go on board. That's right. Anything, anytime you have executives involved, it's as much about you know understanding their motivations and talking them into the right thing as presenting facts. Yeah, gotcha. All right. Well, with that, we're at the end of time. And I want to thank everyone for joining us, especially you, Rich, for uh, offering your time to talk to this group. Uh, I've enjoyed it. I hope everyone else has enjoyed it. And I look forward to the chance to uh, work with you again, Rich. Uh, Great. Thanks, thanks, thanks so much. I appreciate you guys uh, hosting and putting this together.
Yeah, and thanks everyone in the audience. Uh, it's been great. Take care. Bye.